Hi everyone, so thank you for joining us. Um, today we have an amazing panel. Uh, we've got Quentin, Sophia and Jardi. Um, welcome guys and welcome to our audience. Um, so today we're going to discuss the evolving role of a CMO. I think for, for many businesses looking to scale from startups to, to scale-ups, actually that role of a CMO is evolving. And I think increasingly in a world of digitalization, importance of like technology, and actually just thinking about all of those customer touch points, I think increasingly that role of a CMO has become key and central to, to business objectives and growth. So today we'd like to discuss actually how that role evolves, the role a CMO plays when thinking about hiring, do we hire someone on a fractional part-time basis? When do we hire someone full-time? And actually, as we look at building our businesses and thinking about investment, actually, how does that role evolve and, and, and what are the challenges that it presents? Now, as way of an introduction, I'm Madeleine Waitman. I'm co-founder of The Work Crowd. The Work Crowd is a, a global online network of freelancers working across the marketing, communications and PR mix. We have a, a digital award-winning platform that supports our network, matching businesses to the talent that they need and allowing them to centralize and manage their freelance workforce. Um, as chair, I'm also representing our sister company, Hanson Search. So Hanson Search is an executive global um, search business, again, working across that marketing communication and PR mix. Um, they work very much um, across Europe, US, um, and the UAE MENA regions. So um, enough about me. <laughs> let me uh, turn you, uh, or let, let, I'll let to, in, turn you over to our audience. Um, sorry, not our audience, our panel, but to allow them to introduce themselves. So Quinton, over to you next. Hi, uh, so I'm Quentin Poirot, and uh, I've been um, know, I've, I've been at different leadership marketing leadership positions over the, the past four to five years. Uh, you know, between uh, VP marketing, head of marketing, and chief marketing officers at different companies. Um, recently, I've uh, taken an interest into uh, you know um, uh, leading marketing teams working in uh, groups. So where we have basically different focus depending on the different brands that we have to focus on, which has led to a very uh, interesting uh, work challenges and organizational challenges uh, among, among my teams. And uh, yeah, and I'm very happy to, to participate into this panel. Thank you, Quinta. Jardi, over to you. Hi everyone, I am Jadi Tillery. I am a marketeer with 22 years of experience in the sector. Um, I really started uh, focusing on the social space and digital in about um, 2005, actually, way back then. Uh, but since 2013, I've been working particularly with uh, private equity and VCTs, um, working to support their companies, uh, their portfolios, or supporting um, companies who are seeking investments. So typically series A and series B. So I say that I go in support um, founders or fund managers getting marketing sorted, working and um, geared up for growth. So that is sort of my area of focus. Brilliant, thanks Jardi. And Sophia? Oh, we can't hear um, you. Okay. I uh, I'm Sophie RL. Um, okay. I can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You, we can hear you now. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So uh, yeah, so I have been a CMO for over 25 years. Uh, my background is tech. So um, I moved to the UK back in '94. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. I lived here half my life now. I'm Swedish um, and have spent my career being a CMO in-house for a whole number of different very fast, high growth type tech ventures, um, unicorns like Skype and Spotify. Um, now I do very similar to Jardi. In fact, um, for the past 15 years, I've been a portfolio CMO. Um, I, support, uh, I support funded businesses, uh, everything from startups all the way to series B, series C, scaling up um, and uh, build marketing functions build marketing tech stacks to ensure that we are on that growth trajectory. Um, I also work um, very similar to Jardis. Again, I work with fund managers 
for private equity firms um, focus on, again, tech uh, in Europe and in the US, wanting to invest growth capital uh, into successful businesses and successful brands. And, uh, and I have the, the privilege of being an advisor to boards, uh, being an advisor to CEOs and leadership teams to help them create successful ventures. Brilliant. Thanks, Sophia. Well, we've got a really lovely mix of actually full-time, fractional, lots of international experience, and obviously a huge amount of experience of scaling up. Now, actually, just for the benefit of our audience, we do have time at the end for a Q&A session. So at the bottom, you'll see there's a Q&A sort of um, section there. So please do um, put any questions that you have for our panel um, there, and, and we will look to address them at the end. So... I think as a sort of starter, let's actually discuss, you know, if we think about the role of the CMO today and, and actually what it perhaps was traditionally, um, it would be great to get your thoughts in terms of how it's changed, but, but also perhaps what traditionally made up a good CMO. Um, and actually, is that, is that still relevant in today's market? So, you know, maybe Jardi, you can start us here. Sure. Well, I think, you know, the hallmark of a traditional CMO was certainly someone who was a charismatic visionary leader, someone who was going to sort of make change and innovation within an organization, largely through more traditional advertising uh, mediums, like, you know, great iconic TV ads that we know and love and still remember. I mean, certainly I still remember them from my childhood. Uh, that's the lasting sort of impression that they had. What I have certainly seen in terms of the evolution of the CMO is how much uh, more clear closely they are now tied with the actual business needs and deliverables. So in my time in the marketplace, you know, it really does come down to marketing not as a nice to have, as something that's gearing up to win awards and do beautiful advertising campaigns, but something that fundamentally affects the bottom line. So I've seen, a, a, you know, certainly a rise in CMOs that have specialisms. Mine happens to be in the digital space, which obviously has a huge currency and commodity because that's where, you know, certainly people are transacting, whether that's that's B2B or B2C. Um, but certainly in terms of my thoughts on the evolution of the CMO is it's it's a necessity because it's very closely tied to business needs and deliverables, not just beautiful award-winning ad campaigns. No, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely key there. And I think um, you know, one of the things that we, we wanted to address today is you know, when businesses are thinking about where they are in, in terms of their own evolution, what you know at what point is it is it relevant to bring on that cmo and, and from a business perspective um you know what do they need to be thinking about in terms of their business objectives um how they're going to work with the cmo the benefit that cmo will bring so perhaps quentin you know as a cmo for a number of you know fast startups moving to scale ups what's your thoughts on that um I think that the, the primary thing usually is to try to get uh, what is the the segment or the you know the first campaigns I would say that's going to be working for you wherever you want to target. Like you have to really start to understand uh, what what your audience, what your customers are at, and try to be focused there in the very beginning. Um, in my experience, we're going from startups to scale ups. There's a lot of uh, bets that you do in the beginning, but you have to make sure to move fast and to bet on the right thing. So you don't have to be afraid of doing a lot of mistakes, but being able to spot those mistakes very early on. Because the moment you get the magic formula, I would say, this is when you need to invest the minimum amount of, you know, the, the limited more like uh, resources that you have in the beginning uh, when you're starting a company. And when you got that channel uh, settled, this is what you're gonna be able to build afterwards. The other things you wanna build on in terms of, uh, you know, creating channels, funnels, uh, you know, all, all those things. And this is really the thing that is uh, important not to miss. Uh, the first steps, uh, you know, locking that in, and then you can build uh, from there. So, so you're thinking very much there about, actually from a business perspective, where's my low hanging fruit? Exactly. But actually, what's my key differentiator in terms of what's gonna set me apart from perhaps my competitors and what's our, the marketing sort of strategy objective? Is that, yeah. Is, yeah, okay. And um, when thinking about that, you know, that hire in terms of what's the, the right CMO, do you feel it's important for someone, you know, to be looking at someone who's a, a specialist or, because or, as Jadi was saying, very much she's come from that digital first background or, 
is it better to look at someone who's actually got that breadth and perhaps agility to, to look at things in a bit more of a holistic approach? It, it really, I mean, I think it depends on the industry you're in. Basically, if you're starting an e-commerce business, you will need as your first marketeer, your first CMO to have someone that's going to get a hang of, uh, you know, search engine uh, marketing, you know, everything related to ACA and SEO. Um, if you know that you can get your low-hanging fruits, uh, you know, through events or uh, more like a media type campaign because, you know, PR, all that kind of stuff. This is where you should focus more your first hires. And this may be the first step that, you know, it's, are you going to be um, shaping your marketing function first? Uh, and this is what I think is important to look at when you, you get your first hires, if you know all those things. Otherwise, better to hire a generalist and try to do those experiments. Oh, uh, I have an intuition. I think this is the way we're going to do our business. And then you try those experiments. The important is to frame them uh, in time and the budget you want to allow them. Uh, you know, you're allowing yourself to, to spend to this experiment and be able to move fast if you realize this is not where you want to go. So I would say if you're not sure, generalist, if you already have a hint because of your business and, you know, your business says a lot about where you know what your first customers are going to be, probably try to hire somebody or a couple of people that are very good at doing those specific things. And you touch on that, you talk about experiments. So effectively trying to get your market advantage. Now, I think that sort of leads into one of the questions that we, we talked about broadly, which is that sort of creativity versus data. Um, because in some respects, is that experimenting? Is that the creative element? Is the data then backing up? So what, just tell me, um, and maybe actually, because we haven't heard from Sophia here, we should hear from Sophia, on, although I'm sure everyone's got something to say on this. Um, your thoughts in terms of um, what comes first, the interplay between the two? Um, so, yeah, I, sorry. Oh. Sophia. Thank you. So I think that's an excellent question. And I would say that I will give my perspective and then Quentin can compare because I, I have a feeling that we may, may have slightly different uh, perspectives on this. Given what I have just um, told you, I am typically in the really heavy growth stage for a business um, where majority or minority investors are actually a, an important influencer and usually on the board uh, wanting to see results. So I would say that in those circumstances, if you are an early stage or uh, you're really on that quiet data is is essential and being data driven is usually where you get as a CMO I suppose tactically but also as growth um, strategy is um, you get um, your audience from from your C-suite who are interested in understanding how we can create marketing in a more I suppose scientifically led uh, realm as opposed to creative. However, having said that, if you're not innovative in your product development, in your go-to-market strategy, in your positioning, in your, in your branding, in your brand communications, um, then you're not going to be successful. So I think that data first, as far as high growth, venture or PE back businesses um, with with a strong element of innovation and uh, and creativity would be my answer. Quentin, your your thoughts on on that that the debate in terms of do you lead as Sophia is saying with with data but keep in mind that creativity um, uh, or, yeah. or actually you know, how, how do you set yourself apart? You know, should creativity lead and actually then it's backed up by data? So, yeah. So as we're seeing in the introduction, uh, marketing function used to be about doing those nice ads and hours and everything. And it was not so much data we're looking at in terms of, uh, oh, that looks cool. Oh, that sounds awesome. Oh, a friend of mine told me about the campaign you made. So it must have worked, right? There was a lot of your mouth and like a, 
uh, those kind of things. Now that we have the possibility to actually be able to tie all those lists to customers afterwards, and you know, we know more or less where they come from, there's always like a bit of a you know fuzzy thing sometimes in attribution channels and things like this. I think it's very important, as Sophia was saying, to to when you actually try to focus on the early stages. Yeah, if you're trying, if you can identify exactly where you you know the first stream, big stream of customers going to get come from, just focus on that. That's the first thing you need to get. Mm -hmm. um, what I realized also in my experience is that um, I, I saw, I worked with people that were just really data that I focused, but sometimes we're missing out the context. And there are two pieces I want to talk about there. The context of, uh, you know, somebody has one day brought me a report of Google Analytics and he said, look at this. We have so many people coming from uh, pe uh, people using Chrome in English. So we should do a part of the product in English. We should have a website in English. We do all those things in English. Uh, the reality was that a lot of people install Chrome in English and don't change the, 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 the language to their own language. So there we were borderline about to make a decision to target another audience that was actually not our targeted audience. The second thing is that uh, I really believe also in the creative innovation like Sophia was saying, and I believe that I can come right afterwards to try to frame all these experiments or try to see if you're going the right way. At the moment you start your experiment, you're trying to try is to you start a new campaign and you're trying to push this new, you know, language elements or this new design or whatever. Um, this is really also the moment you have to say to, to tell your team, okay, what is the expected outcome on this? You don't have to be precise, just give a rough number of what you expect. And after the first two weeks or one month, try to look at the results you were anticipating with the action you're, you're, you're putting forward. If you realize that you're really not aligned with like what you expected, maybe it is the time still, you know, to make a bit of a change to move on to the next ideas. And I think this is where data can become super essential in terms of marketing right now, is that you don't have to focus too long on the wrong idea or the wrong campaign, you have you are able at some point to get this type of uh, you know stop that says, hold on guys, it looks like we're going the wrong way here. So we should probably focus now on something else or maybe look at it in, in a bit of a different way. No, really interesting. I think there is that, you know, there is always that balance about where you are in your business, what your objectives are and, and what does come first. Jardi, what are your thoughts on it? Um, well, this might be a slight <clears throat> bias of mine, but I actually think it's a false binary. I think, you know, in my life, I've been trying to reconcile what is it to love data and also love creative execution. Um, and I come back fundamentally to my first degree, which was in rhetoric. And all data does is inform us in terms of how we reach our audience in a meaningful way. So it doesn't limit your creativity. In fact, it enhances your ability to be creative. Like Quinton was saying, you know, if you put up a campaign, it's not really hitting that allows you to sort of um, alter it or change it quite quickly. Um, so I, you know, I think that data and creativity come hand in hand. I don't think one comes before the other. I think they inform one another and are inextricably linked. It's not, it, you know, it's a false binary. Um, you know, we sort of like to, to separate um, and think that they're not interrelated just because compartmentalization works for everyone. But certainly in a marketing discipline, you have to have all of the pieces to make sure that you're um, finding the solutions that are really resonating with your audience. No, I... <laughs> Well, we're very well put, Jardy, because I think exactly, yeah, from a marketing point of view, when we're thinking about um, all of those different touch points, that exactly that. We need creative campaigns to engage, but actually we need to be mindful of, of how we best spend limited resources to, you know, most effectively reach that audience. Um, you touched earlier on, um, Sophia, and, and you likewise, Jardine, know have had a lot of experience in that in this area of a business that's then looking to raise investment. So going from series A to B. So thinking about one as a CMO, actually that CMO founder relationship, and then that evolving into that CMO investor relationship. Um, and, and the challenges there, and perhaps, um, I don't know who wants to start on this one. <laughs> uh, perhaps, Sophia, do you want to, um, you know, perhaps touch on, on your experiences there? No, happily. Just checking in, I see comments that people can't hear me. Is that still... I think... I think it's the fact I, I've got a feeling that your um, bandwidth, your your Wi-Fi is probably not amazing. So there's a little bit of a um, a delay. Maybe put your volume on on max. Um, okay, apologies for this. Um, living in the English countryside, 
has its drawbacks. So the comment I'd like to make regarding that relationship being supporting of the uh, of the founder and and being on the sell side, if you like, as 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 we say, um, is I think quite an easy it, it's an easy relationship to have if you build the trust. And I think I think I mentioned this to Madeline in, in our briefing. If you're raising capital, it's a marketing exercise. In, in with all intents and purposes, you're you have a, a clear growth strategy, ideally a clear exit strategy of where you want to take the business, which markets, how you want to sell it, to which valuation. And with that, it's just like finding any customer audience. You extend your stakeholder audience to investors, um, be them private equity VCs. So that investor relationship, I think, for most most marketeers who have a strong strategic um, approach to growth is is not particularly difficult. Would be my comment. Quentin, from your perspective, having worked um, with a number of startup scale ups, what are your thoughts, particularly around that CMO founder relationship? You know, I think for a lot of founders, um, when they make that initial hire of, of hiring a CMO, it's quite hard for them to let go of the reins. <laughs> Most of the company I worked at work with, um, basically the, the, the step was at the, the moment where the, the founder or the CEO, uh, mostly the founders, uh, realized that they needed time to focus on other things. And uh, they, they, started, they started with their ideas and what they wanted to, you know, to go after and the, the, the market they expected to target. At some point, they're just like, okay, I need time to do this. So we're going to hire someone to, to, to do this work instead. Um, what I realized is that it's essential critical that the communication between the two people, the first marketing or the CMO of a company or a startup or scale up, and the CEO or the founder, if he's in charge directly, is extremely well done. Um, the founder or the CEO will always have a certain mindset because he started a company, was in charge of the company for so long, and he has those ideas already. And when you, when I, you know, multiple times when I join a company, I've been told, okay, this is how we do business. So you should probably do this. But part of my job also to be able to find the time to uh, say, okay, maybe we could take a step back because we have other ideas we could explore and maybe this is gonna be actually the best bet to do now. But you always have, you're gonna have to convince uh, them because in the end, the beginning in the early stages, you don't have a lot of money. So basically it's a big bet that you wanna take as a marketeer because you're excited about this thing that you, you see and you wanna go um, with. And on the other side, the person in front of us will be like, yeah, well, okay, but you know, just know that um, you know, we can only do so much. Um, so it's very really essential that those two people talk a lot. And I really, one of my, uh, when, I, when I really think is that the founder or CEO and the, the CMO must be aligned and every type of miscommunication or not so sure, you know, type of items must be cleared out as easy, as quickly as possible, because uh, otherwise at some point, some question will come back. And if there is a misalignment, it's going to hurt the relationship. And uh, in the early stages, that could be, uh, you know, a, a you know, bigger problem than it would be in a, in a later in a, in a company life. Um, Thank you, Quentin. And um, I mean, you know, thinking about sort of going back a little bit to that making that higher. So think about you know, the business objectives, what you want to achieve, the audience, growth plans, um, and and maybe what stage you're at in terms of your evolution. Because um, I think from a, you know, for a lot of businesses, CMO is critical in terms of the business growth. But at the same time, I think there can be that 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 um, that reticence, which perhaps comes from one letting go of, of, of the, the the strings, as it were. But but secondly, it's a big investment, um, and you know, with that big investment, you want a, a good return. So, as a business, when you're thinking about hire, what to hire and who to hire, you know, we touched on: is it a fra fractional CMO? Is it is it interim? Is it full time? Now. Um, Quentin, I think you obviously you're in a full time role. Jardi and Sophia have both um, are in 
or Jardine in the interim with doing lots of advisory work and, and Sophia, you've done lots of fractional, but I know you've also done lots of fractional CMO uh, roles, Jardine. So it would be great to get um, you as a panel, your thoughts on that. So perhaps over to you, Jardy, for this one. So I feel like I have a little bit of a cheat sheet here because I am, um, Madeline mentioned sort of the company that I'm consulting with at the moment. They have analyzed over 7,000 successful exits um, since 2010 and the upper quartile, so the top 25 that had the highest return, 98% of those individuals switched out their senior leadership team. They made changes faster and they changed more senior leaders to bring in the expertise that was really geared up for growth. So when we talk about bringing someone in, they have functional um, experience, domain experience, and sector experience. Sector obviously being the industry that you work in, your function. Have you been a CMO before? Have you been a you know marketing director and you're ready to take that CMO leap? The domain, um, the the sort of um, the sort of domain experience would be a little bit more. Do they have the experience of a similar growth journey? So have they taken a, a company through sort of a, a growth experience? And I think that is really important because the needs of one business, albeit they may be in the same sector, they may want a CMO, where they are in their journey really determines who they should be bringing into the organization. And I am all for bringing in, I mean, biased again, but you know, I'm all for bringing in, you know, that interim um, support or that fractional support, particularly in the early stages before someone will commit to, you know, that, that permanent hire. But very much to Quentin's point, it's only successful if there are open lines of communication and the role is very focused on sort of a project or a deliverable that's geared around that company's particular stage of growth or their aims. So um, don't be afraid of change. If anything, you know, bring them in. And I do understand, you know, there is um, often a desire to bring in, um, you know, the skill set, but also a slight reluctance to hand over some decision making to the CMO. So I think individuals thinking about it just need to be comfortable with bringing in an expert who's experienced this before and can give them the advice that will ultimately get their company to where they want it to go. Um, so that's just a little bit of insight. Well, it's, it's, yeah, well, that's really interesting insight. And uh, yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. You know, if you look at a, a fast growth business, their needs today are going to be very different to their needs tomorrow. And I think there is often that challenge when thinking about, you know, this, your internal staff, do you, do you promote them into that, into that role, that senior role, or let them grow with your organization? Or at the point where perhaps, you know, Sophia was talking earlier on about from series A to series B, and you've touched on Jardy, do you then bring in that, that, that expertise from outside the organization who has that previous track record? Um, so it's very, it's interesting to get those insights, insights there. In terms of them being answerable to investors, um, you know, how, how do you manage those investor relations um, as a CMO? I mean, I think from my perspective, it really is bringing in, particularly for sort of startups, yes, scale-ups too, bringing in a discipline of sort of reporting in a way that a board will understand, that the finance directors will understand. You know, we have our own metrics in marketing that are absolutely valid for our discipline, but we need to be able to communicate clearly the value that we're bringing into the business in the language that they speak. So I think um, that is how you communicate to investors. You have to speak their language back to that rhetoric piece, you know, know how to talk to your audience, right? So bring in the data points, um, the insights, the actual metrics that make the most sense to them. And then you can justify, you know, increasing your marketing spend, diversifying the marketing activity that you're doing. But fundamentally, it comes down to how you're communicating in the way in which you're communicating um, for them. Because because all they care about is, you know, the business needs and function and growth, right? So and ultimately quite often revenue. So unless you're talking about revenue, if you're talking about engagement and they want to talk about revenue, you're speaking two different languages. So make sure you're speaking in the way that they understand. And I mean, that that sort of leads on to another point, which is traditional sales has changed. You know, it does sales as we used to think of it exist or actually is marketing the new sales and, and what's the interrelationship between marketing function and sales you know what would be your advice to, to businesses in that respect um, maybe quentin you can answer this one <laughs> um 
Yeah, I mean, I, I worked most uh, mostly in companies where SaaS, uh, you know, sort of service based or really fully online, and they're basically over ninety percent of the income were generated basically because um, marketing was, you know, doing running campaigns and people were just coming on a website and buying things right right away. Um, and uh, the previous company I was working at, for example, uh, we built a sales team after three years uh, when we started to branch out to other products that necessitated more, uh, you know, to work to lead a bit more. It's like not even a lead at that point here where the person was just interested and we're trying to convince them that the solution that we're sending was the best, but we needed that extra push uh, because the, you know, just uh, self-service aspect of it was not enough because it was a bit of a more complicated product. So my answer would be depends on what you're selling. Uh, but uh, if you, if you are, you know, if you're doing e-commerce, if you're doing something that people can buy by themselves, uh, I think there's a lot of companies now that can just focus on marketing, digital marketing, and probably can, you know, are not so much in need of a, of a sales team. That those are very specific industries, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it really depends on what you do. But uh, I really believe that now we have like most a lot, lot more tools, a lot of more ways to to do things that just to uh, you know shorten the time between uh, you have a prospect come to your website and you close a sale, and most of those times people can do it themselves or find information about what you're selling by themselves, and it's just faster. Uh, for yeah, all businesses that are working like this. Uh, marketing becomes much more important, becomes the primary uh, person you will want to talk to uh, in the company about how can I make more revenue? Like, uh, you know, what type of a type of customers can you bring in, things like this? No, I, you know, I agree. I think, um, you know, customers have become much more savvy in terms of, of actually how we communicate to them. And um, of course, it will depend as a business in terms of your your life, your sales life cycle, what you're selling. Um, but I think data certainly, going back to what we've been talking about earlier on, is probably pivotal in terms of then backing up the role of that marketing function and, and, and making it effectively business critical. Now, um, as a panel between you, you have lots of, of international experience. Um, I know Quentin, you've worked in Sweden and obviously in, you're in France and Sofia. Um, you, you are Swedish, but um, I know you work with a lot of businesses, particularly as they're looking to expand and, and looking at the sort of interna internationalization. Um, now, when we're thinking about that, um, what would you say are the challenges for a CMO? Um, and likewise, as a business, so that interplay between the business looking to expand and, and, and then as a CMO, how you enable that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. If I'll switch off my camera whilst I'm talking and hopefully we'll get at least good audio um, if, uh, if my Wi-Fi is, is failing. That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that the, the key focus, and I think a little bit to, to Quentin's point, depending on what you're selling, are you selling big complex solutions, SaaS with uh, perhaps managed services wrapped around it or a, a product as a service uh, of sorts. The important thing is to obviously understand to a great extent the different market cultures. Very often, and I think particularly now that we are post-Brexit mode, very often um, it used to be the Europeans going into the, U the UK before they went to the US, which was a misnomer in that we thought of the UK and the US are the same things. Let's start and practice in the UK because then we can just take that concept, take that message, that strategy and go to market in the US. I think now I see um, as a result that there is a lot more appetite to actually skip the UK and a lot of businesses, tech businesses are going straight into the US. And I think there are challenges with that, um, definitely. And, and whilst you get lured by the opportunity and sheer size of the US market, the, the cost of your, as in your cost of your cost, your cost of your sales and your cost of your marketing and the budget that is required to, to go into these huge markets, mm sometimes cripple you so I think that my advice as a CMO is usually you you pick uh, you pick a market that you do substantial research upon you understand it it's similar to your home market there are similarities between 
how that market behaves compared to your own job or your home market, and you test it from there. And it's an iterative process, it really is. Um, so, so I think that those are the sort of market macro aspects. Um, another very common strategy now that is used is account-based marketing, where you basically target a set of key accounts that are typically global, and you can go in and sell to that company, to that account as a marketplace. And I would say that if you want to scale fast, as far as internationalization, this in all terms, land and expand type strategy can sometimes be more effective by actually targeting, not necessarily geographies, but your key um, target uh, potential customers. No, thanks for that. And then just thinking about, you know, that international internationalization and expansion and how as a CMO do you um, address the challenges of, of ensuring you have the right team and, and the right local knowledge so that you you understand the nuances of, of your of your customers in those different regions. Perhaps um, Quentin, do you want to answer this? Um, there's um, I worked in a couple of companies who were trying to uh, to go international and we did actually work in two companies that tried to go to the US as you were saying Sophia is like oh so many opportunities let's get there because at least if we get you know, X percent of the market, X being a very low number, we would get so much more money. Um, I think it really depends on the market you're trying to, to, to target. Like um, the, the, the thing I've seen uh, in terms of experience is that it's, it's much better if you hire some people like locally that will do those, those work for you. So I would say business development and then the marketing comes in as a support. Uh, you know, can you guys help us try to find what would be the best thing here? I've had some, uh, you know, interesting contacts in that industry while scoring around and like discussing in, into those networking events. Can you confirm or not hypothesis by running, you know, an A-B test or something like this? Uh, try to confirm uh, hypothesis. Um, the, the, I, I work in a company where basically the idea was to expand in the US and the first hires were VPs, uh, but most of the groundwork was still done in Europe. Um, that was complicated. It, it, it shows like some challenges pretty early on. I worked in other companies that went to the US and went total opposite way. They hired salespeople and they were not completely fully hired. This, this is the solution is how you sell it. Now take your car and just go around and try to sell it and see how it works. And this took a bit more time to grow up and work in the US, but now the company is like opening offices in Canada and the US and everywhere. And it took like maybe six years to make it work. Uh, but I think definitely the way is that uh, you, you're gonna need some people you know, on the ground, talking to people up there, understanding the market, maybe some locals that will know the industry, you know, who to talk to, what influencers uh, to help you there. Um, so I, I would say probably focus more a bit on the biz dev aspect of things than hire a local market team, because now I think most of the marketing care actions could be done, you know, from anywhere in the world, since most of the things going to be digital, and then you can just support the team there by, by you know, taking care of logistics for events or uh, managing that, that type of things. Brilliant. And Jardi, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I had sort of come, I want to give some examples from the other side of it. So I worked with Time Out Media globally. So across 109 cities, <laughs> I worked with North Sales across 500 on ground locations. So I was in the position where, you know, local marketing had been set up and it was my role to sort of create a centralized standard um, to ensure that, you know, the brand integrity was, was still there regardless of the marketplace. So I never want to lose that local marketing expertise. But to Quentin's point, I think, and to your earlier point about sort of the relationship between sales and marketing, I think, you know, when I'm going into a local market, it really is about exploiting or deepening the relationship with the sales teams, um, the business development teams, because they have the insight. And although they might not be in a marketing mindset, they know the pain points of your potential customer. So therefore you can start to gear up your, you know, the relevant marketing that um, will work best for that particular marketplace. But you do always have to have local knowledge. You, you cannot get away from that because every market has its own nuances. Um, but it's it may be that you don't have a full-scale marketing team, but you do have some resource that you can maximize and they can and give you the insights for you then to potentially deploy campaigns from, you know, a more central, you know, if you're UK based into, into sort of a new market. So um, use what you've got, but always respect local knowledge. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Jody. So I think this sort of quite leads on quite nicely to um, 
I think some of the questions we've got quite a few, so I'm going to set a bit aside. So I think as Emma, who sort of she made the comment that actually personally she thinks that marketing is done by the whole company, and that sort of bellies a little bit of what you're saying, Jardy, particularly as you're going into new territories, actually taking where there is someone in sales, taking that that knowledge and 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 that feeding through. Um, so she asks the question that, well, she's she's commented that she's finding that actually change management is increasingly part of her role too, um, really to, in, to optimize those resources, thinking about actually marketing being done by the whole company. So actually that blending um, across sales and marketing um, and, and really as a business, I think from a, a broader communications point of view, um, if you think about employee engagement, they you know, your your employees become part of your marketing function. So it'd be good to get um, our panel's thoughts on that. Who who would like to answer that one? Jardy, are you gonna go? <laughs> Uh, sure. So absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, marketing function is a lot of the work that I do. I'm sure Sophia and Quentin will all say like getting the actual function in place is, is a key part of it. And yes, absolutely. There are certain individuals within an organization, within an organization, whether it's B to B or B to C, who will potentially be front facing thought leaders for you that you want to leverage. But like everyone in the business needs to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Like they all need to deeply understand the brand. So a lot of times what I will do is you know, hold informal, you know, lunch and learn sessions or information sessions so that people understand what the marketing team is doing or a new rebrand or a new website launch or, you know, all of this. So everyone is kind of on the same page and has that same reference point. Um, and I do also work quite closely with the sales um, teams and the customer service teams as well, because mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's me. I'm a control freak. I want to have that customer through the whole journey. Like I want to know what the sales team is saying to them. So I want to see what this is coming out in that playbook, because if that's then, you know, not me marrying up with what they're seeing in sort of, you know, the marketing campaigns that I'm building, then there's already a disconnect there. And if we set their expectations high in terms of the sales and, and the marketing, but then in customer service, it really falls off a ledge and they're not feeling like their needs are being met or it's been serviced um, in the way that they were expecting through the sales and marketing process, you know, that's an issue too. So I think understanding the function um, and really starting to break down silos within organizations so that it fundamentally is a seamless journey for your customer, whether that's B2B or B to C is really, really important. So process comes into it a lot. And there's a lot of sort of unpicking of processes. Certainly me coming in as a consultant is really understanding the function, how I can make that better, how I can make sure that there's more communication between departments so that everyone is um, feels knowledgeable and empowered with the marketing that we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're representing ourselves so that there's no disconnect. Because that, you know, regardless of what sector you're in, regardless of whether you're B2B or B2C, everyone is representing your brands. If they are your employee, they're representing your brand. So they need sort of the resource and the knowledge behind them to be kind of confident in any conversations that they have. I think you, you probably actually answered, um, I was going to, the next question was Morris's question, which actually talks very much about that, you know, the CMO sitting very much at, at the center of product sales, customer success, service, and, and really how to manage those different needs. You know, how do you manage those different needs and the different um, objectives of the different audiences? But I think you were talking very much that process being at the heart of that. So I think you've answered that one quite nicely. So Kelly, um, Kelly comments that the CMO is the shortest tenured C-suite role. Could we get the panel's thoughts on the context of how the CMO role is changing in relation to that? And, and perhaps, the, uh, perhaps the advantage of being a, a portfolio executive in that case. Um, so perhaps, Sophia, you can answer this one. Yeah, no, of course. Um, I think that is really interesting uh, because you're right, um, Kelly. This is um, this is a concern of a lot of hiring managers, be them CEOs, or um, if, if the marketing function sits in a in a more of a, a BD uh, line reporting structure. That how long is my marketing manager going to stay? How long is the CMO going to stay? How much is this going to cost us? Um, and I think in a slightly perverse way, this is partly why fractional or interim CMO um, opportunities are out there. 
So you can always argue that we are taking advantage of our own bad reputation, staying short, uh, staying for short tenures. Um, but without being flippant, I think there is always a risk with hiring very senior, costly executives, be it a product, uh, a CPO or a CSO or a CRO or a CMO. And I think the challenge for CMOs is back to what we discussed earlier is to prove our value and to really showcase and future proof how we add that value to the balance sheet, to the profitability of the business, to the brand equity, to the valuation of the company. If you can't do that, nobody, to, to Jody's point uh, from an investor or board perspective, nobody will spend you know, X hundred thousand on, on investing in a CMO. And as a result, we'll de-risk, which is what investors always like, and go for a more perhaps low risk option and hire someone with a specific competency to drive the marketing function on a fractional or on an interim basis. Mm. And it's interesting because obviously, Jardy, you talked earlier on about the insights that, that, that you've got from the research that, that you currently um, are involved in. And we've talked about the changing needs from startup to scale up, um, bringing in that expertise. And when we're thinking about the different objectives from a business, um, so you know, what do we want to achieve? Does that, have a, does that have an implication in terms of, do we hire someone on a fractional basis or do we hire someone on a permanent basis? Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's a bit of a lead, Quentin. Um, no, I, I wanted to add on uh, on something else is that uh, when, I mean, on something to the same topic, right? It's um, when your, your company, when you have your first, uh, your first marketeer, your first marketing director or CMO, and you are at the, you know, seed or series A stage, uh, the scope of the CMO is going to be so much. It's probably going to be managing two to three people, something like this. So once you start to get tens of, you know, tens mm -hmm. of millions of dollars, this at some point you're going to, need to scale your team very quickly because those investors are going to need to see the return on investment. And it's one of the moments that the CMO changes, basically, because you will want in your company to hire somebody that probably already read that book, how to scale your team fast, how to scale your business fast. And there is actually this weird moment where you got this person in your company that helped you build wherever you are right now, but you have to introduce the fact that you're going to need somebody else now to take his role to another level. And it's not that you don't believe in this person, but it's more like either you take the bet of staying with this person because you know they have potential or you can, you know, train them or teach them like things, find somebody mentors that that comes along and help you. So maybe a fractional CMO with more experience. Uh, or or you, you just trust everything on that person to lead your marketing function to, to get to the next stage. And I believe that sometimes the shape of the position within a company changes so much that some people just don't see themselves there anymore. They're like, I don't understand. Like, there's so many people around me now. There's so many things to manage now. I, it's not what I wanted to do. It's not what I signed up for. And they're gonna move on by themselves most of the time, trying to find, uh, you know, the sweet spot of a, of a company, of a startup where they can, they feel they can make, they can make much more of an impact because this is early stage and they, they brought it to uh, mm -hmm. to this very level. And I think that's also one of the reason, you know, for startups that are successful and you know growing into scale ups. Sometimes you have people uh, who have a CMO uh, title and they're gonna switch early to you know, to another company or something else because the need of the company is going to evolve based on the, the growth the company is expected to, to, to evolve in when they get billions of dollars, mostly. No, I think that's a very good point because actually just as the needs of the company change, actually if we're thinking about as an individual, I'm a CMO, the type of company I'd want to work, what attracted me to the role in the first place? And, and if actually that's changed and evolved, it, it may no longer be the right company. Now, Matt here, um, I think it's good question, um, has asked, as a rule of thumb, you know, metrics to measure return on investment in marketing, you know, what, what does good look like? And are there other important metrics to consider? He's also asked, you know, in terms of actually thinking perhaps in relation to that early start, um, like what's the right time for a startup or scale up to actually make that investment and hire a CMO? So I'm going to, Jardy, over to you. 
So I kind of feel like those are two questions. So in terms of what good looks like, I think every business needs to set their what good looks like. Okay. So it could be re revenue. It could be subscriptions. It could be, you know, it could be, you, you know, the business sets it based on the business needs. Um, the, and those should always be deeply ingrained and tied into marketing and what it's doing. Then on like a more tactical or functional level, you know, you want to make sure that any marketing execution that you're doing is on par with, you know, email performance should look like this. Your website performance should look like this. Your engagement on social media should be around this mark. And there's lots of resources online, like literally just Google search it because <laughs> insights and platforms have put out benchmarks in terms of what good looks like for not only the marketing channel, but also the specific sector. So there is the information out there and definitely should be doing that in, in your marketing team. But ultimately you need to be tied into the goals um, of the business. And the other question was when to bring on a CMO, was that it? Well, actually maybe this is a question for Sophia because actually if I look at the question before, uh, Matt is saying that as a, they're a, a PR agency that, that work very much with scale-ups um, and they tend not to work with pre-series A in part because it's too early stage and they lack that traction to be seen as credible with the press. So I think from Matt's perspective, thinking about, you know, his customer base, um, you know, at what point would be the right time for that startup slash scale-up to actually make that investment in a CMO? I think that's an excellent question. Oh yeah, excellent question, Matt. Um, I I have to negotiate quite often with CEOs who are very keen to go out and talk to the press with perhaps not that much to actually talk about because they're not mature, they don't have enough traction in the market, they don't have enough perhaps paying customers, uh, the product is not mature, you're still at proof of concept. So I think there is a lot um, just to actually say about in PR readiness uh, goes along Series A investment readiness. And I think that is where I typically advise that once you have your funding secured, that's when you go large and start really pushing your brand, get a lot of air cover through PR, um, through social, through, you know, across all your different channels, digital and more traditional. So I think that if I was to advise you, I would tend to avoid pre-series A, uh, unless you come across something that you think has got that incredible, um, innovative and, and unique uh, proposition, be it a new um, piece of technology, be it an AI uh, driven, medical treatment that can save people's lives etc i mean those would be the the nuggets in the the early stage perhaps incubators from universities where you think it's a really fantastic story but other than that i would i would wait and i would advise these these type of customers and these type of customers um to wait for their big push and on in terms of then hiring actually looking at hiring a cmo um do you know is is or, or should everyone whether it's you know should everyone have a cmo whether it is on a fractional basis or <laughs> i mean at some point you know the founder is going to lead the marketing and you know at what point does that founder go okay actually i'm going to make that investment in a cmo even if it is on a you know it might be on a fractional basis to to meet key business objectives um, so I think that was one of the questions that, that Matt asked. Maybe, um, Quentin, you can answer that one. So, uh, sorry, you said at what moment uh, is it key to start to hire CMO, right? Um, I, I, you know, the, the, the idea, I mean, to me, like when you start a company or a startup or very early stage, uh, CMO is always like a big title. Uh, in the sense that somebody is going to have a big impact in the company, but in the end, probably somebody is going to be by himself or herself or managing a couple of, uh, I don't know, I would say interns or contractors. Uh, so it's more of a marketing manager or somebody that will take the lead on the marketing actions. Um, when you need to start to think about, you know, you know, scaling up things up and everything, we need to, to, to uh, reformalize your product market fit and all those strategies going to bring you to, you know, 
you know, five, six, seven, ten years afterwards. Uh, so that, that's the moment I would say that you need to try a CMO. Um, and that's probably between Serie A and Serie B, like at the moment where things start to accelerate, when you need to structure the marketing function, when you start to look at, you know, to basically, as I was saying, like start to work with somebody who is already the already read the book uh, in a different setting, but we'll have all those shortcuts and, and all those know-how uh, to help you go, get there faster. Um, yeah, that, that would be my answer. No, I think that's good. That's good advice. Because actually, really, you bring that CMO on board when you're really looking to scale your team and, and scale your offering and reach new customers. So yeah, well, we've been a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us and, and a big thank you to our amazing panel. We will um, be sharing this recording um, and likewise doing a, a bit of a write up. Um, so um, we will share that with our audience. Um, so uh, yeah, great. So thank you and, um, and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you.